I mean, at the end of the day, if this settlement is approved, the Sacklers will still be billionaires. And there will be lots of people who died on overdoses to Oxycontin and lives and communities, I believe, that were destroyed by this drug. I guess I would say I have very mixed feelings about it. I want money flowing to the families and the people who have been harmed by Oxycontin. On the other hand, uh, I understand the argument uh, made by others that um, the bankruptcy system it should not be used in this way. Hi, my name is Jason Rasnick, the CEO of Benzinga, and welcome to the Raz Report. As always, before we kick things off, I want to quickly tell you about what Benzinga is. Before I started Benzinga in 2010, there were very few places to get real-time information on financial markets. I thought it was unfair that Wall Street had access to this information before the average Joe investor. So I created Benzinga to level the playing field for you, the retail investor. Benzinga is for the people and by the people. Now, let's dive into the show. All right, welcome to this week's edition of the Raz Report. We have an interesting guest today. We're going to learn about how he won a $1.8 billion verdict. He's also, um, there's a Netflix movie documentary that plays the story, and he's one of the real lawyers from it that, you know, it's based on. We'll get more into it. But he won a $1.8 billion verdict uh, against, I believe, Johnson & Johnson. It's like Aaron Brockovich story, so to speak. Um, but we have Jeffrey B. Simon with us. There's a lot more to him than just the verdict. We'll get into it. It's very casual. Welcome to the Raz Report, Jeffrey B. Simon. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and you just published a book too, right? That's true. I did. I yeah. published a book called Last Rights, The Fight to Save the Seventh Amendment. What is the Seventh Amendment? The right to trial by jury in civil cases, in civil disputes, personal injury, yeah. contract, that kind of thing. And are people trying to not have trial by jury, I guess? is that Exactly. So th the Seventh Amendment is part of the original Bill of Rights. Our founders believed that it would be a bedrock of democracy if disputes, legal disputes between people or people in companies or what have you, were decided by jurors, people from their community with their experiences, their kind of common sensibilities, as opposed to in England where those disputes were decided by the crown or by nobility. And yet over the last 25 years, uh, Industries, big businesses have been very successful um, in electing and funding uh, lawmakers who are sabotaging that right in order to skew the system. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, just dismantle it. But secondly, to the extent that uh, it's permitted to exist, uh, skewed in favor of industries over consumer rights and uh, public health. All right. I'm going to switch to op opioids. All right. Okay? You were involved with a $1.8 billion settlement from Johnson Johnson. First, for the average person, what are op opioids? What are, like, why are they bad? Opioids are a type of uh, controlled substance that can be prescribed for pain. Most of them are derived from opium, just like heroin. And opioids in prescription form are not inherently dangerous. What is dangerous is when they are overprescribed and overpromoted, especially in misleading ways, which is what uh, we, the, the counties I represent, alleged happened uh, and resulted in a group of settlements of which Johnson & Johnson was one uh, of a bit over $2.75 billion to be used for harm reduction throughout the state of Texas. Okay, but how does it get to that kind of level, that like two point, I had 1.8, 2.75 billion? Well, so there was initially, uh, there were six settlements, but there have been subsequent ones. And as, as we have executed them, the number has gone up. Okay, and this is, so why is Johnson & Johnson responsible? Well, the allegation was, is that Johnson Johnson uh, manufactured a series of prescription opioids and promoted them in ways that were not only zealous, but misleading as to their safety and efficacy. Now, I want to be clear that they deny that those allegations are true, but nonetheless, the litigation resulted in the settlements you're describing. So the way they marketed certain drugs kind of thing? Yeah. Rarely in American history has an industry done so much harm to so many people as occurred when certain drug companies promoted and distributed 
gargantuan volumes of highly addictive prescription opioids to physicians and dentists and uh, patients as essential uh, lifestyle improving drugs when in fact they are drugs that should only be prescribed for short periods in limited circumstances with heavy medical monitoring as opposed to for long periods on an outpatient basis. And the allegation is, is that uh, drug companies promoted these drugs as less addictive than they not only are, but they knew them to be. Um, and that they went out of their way to promote these drugs as appropriate for any kind of persistent pain, when in fact, uh, that is a much too dangerous uh, type of prescribing, given the addictive nature and lethality of the drugs. And do they do they deny knowing that they were so addictive? Is that what their argument is? But anyway, nonetheless, they have this Armand they owe. Yeah, they in general, they say we these are legal drugs, quote unquote, and we met FDA guidelines. And of course, we argue that the larger point is, is that we don't we don't disagree that they are controlled substances, what we're saying is, is that you promoted them like they weren't, like they were really appropriate for almost, you know, ubiquitous use and complaints of pain. And again, these are disputed issues in the litigation, but they wound up resulting in these large settlements. Did, did this eventually go to a jury? And that's like how this came about? In, in some jurisdictions. In other words, some of these cases have been tried uh, to verdict. There was a large verdict in Oklahoma against Johnson and Johnson, which was ultimately flipped by the Oklahoma Supreme Court under the theme that the statute upon which those claimants were proceeding was not appropriate for this kind of claim. I wasn't in that case. Um, there have been other verdicts. There was a verdict in New York State, um, whereas our case has not yet gone to verdict. It's still ongoing. These settlements, most of them occurred when we were about to start trial. And I talk about in the book that just the threat that a jury would have the opportunity to view their conduct, I argue, stimulated them to decide they wanted to resolve the case by settlement. And the right to trial by jury is essential for that very thing because it forces every party to consider their positions and think about compromises they might not otherwise have. Got it, because a jury of their peers will be deciding? Exactly. That the idea. Imagine how different that case would be if it was going to be decided in arbitration by lawyers who used to represent drug companies, for example. Right, right. Right. So, understood. So, so this, have you got any settlements then? Um, like the one point, like have you, you said you have one that's still pending. Have you had some that have closed and you got in the settlements and uh, money has, you know, flowed to the claimants, I guess? Yes. So uh, we have executed 11 settlements uh, in Texas opioid litigation, uh, but there are still some other defendants uh, in the cases, and we're continuing to move forward with the cases either to a trial by jury or to settlement. What, um, what like cities or jurisdiction are you in Texas? Are you in San Antonio? Are you Dallas? Where are you? So I am in Dallas and I represent, when I say I, I mean my law firm and me, uh, we represent Dallas County uh, as well as over 40 other counties uh, in uh, the state of Texas. And I work closely with the lawyers that represent um, various counties throughout the state of Texas, including you mentioned San Antonio Bear County. Okay. Now the Purdue Pharma, are you familiar with that case? Very much so. Okay. So the Sackler family, they've been involved and people think that they should owe money. What's your take on, I guess, Will you give a little bit of background on Purdue Pharma? And then what's your take on the wealthy Sackler family after that? Sure. So I write about this in the book, uh, Last Right. By the way, the book, you guys got a good name. The la book's Last Rights, The Fight to Save the Seventh Amendment Thank by you. Jeffrey B. Simon. Put it up a little icon of the book right now, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay. you for that. Okay. So um, Purdue Pharma is the company that we contend started the prescription opioid epidemic as we now know it. And they started it in basically the mid to late 1990s, we allege by over promoting a very powerful and addictive opioid drug called Oxycontin. And we uh, allege, and we believe we have compelling proof that they 
promoted that drug as less addictive and more effective than they knew it to be. And they did it because they could make a ton of money doing it, which they did. And that company, unlike most of the other companies, is not publicly held. It's privately held uh, by members of the Sackler family. Uh, and Raymond and Mortimer Sackler, who are brothers, uh, owned that company and ran it. But for most of the time, the person that really ran it, we contend, uh, was Richard Sackler. And that Richard Sackler uh, was responsible for a lot of what we allege to be misconduct. And the result of all that was that both Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers were sued uh, in opioid litigation, um, which resulted in uh, Purdue Pharma making the decision to file for bankruptcy, which it did and to negotiate a settlement through the bankruptcy process, which was funded in significant part by the Sacklers. And many people objected to that settlement. They said, number one, uh, the settlement was too low in terms of uh, the harm that was done and the money that is needed to compensate uh, people who've been harmed by OxyContin. And two, that the Sacklers were getting off much easier than they should for two reasons. One, they have a lot more money than they put into uh, the settlement. That's one of the arguments. And the other is that uh, the Sacklers themselves never filed for bankruptcy, and yet they're getting the benefit of all the bankruptcy protections, including ultimately a release from civil liability, just like Purdue Pharma. And the argument is, well, they're really the same thing. It's a privately held company, and that shouldn't happen. So in any event, there were objections, but nonetheless, the bankruptcy judge ordered that the settlement was fair. And that issue is now before the United States Supreme Court. And it was argued in December and will be decided by them, we believe, in June. So the interesting thing is, so basically, a private company files bankruptcy. The owner of the private company, the Sackler family, they have the money because basically, if you're a private company, it depends what type of form you are, but... You take the cash flows of the company every year and you take them and you just you keep them, right? And so they have a lot of cash flows. Then there's this lawsuits and this stuff and um, Purdue Pharma files bankruptcy. So then Purdue Pharma doesn't have the money to pay, but the Sacklers took the money from the firm. And so they're making it like one in the same. That's the argument. The argument is that the Sacklers are getting off too easy um, and that the uh, people who've been harmed by OxyContin are not doing well enough. And the argument on the other side is, wait, we made a deal, right? You know, nobody gets everything they want. Uh, and when you make a settlement, it should be honored and the United States Supreme Court shouldn't disturb it. That's the contention uh, from the Sackler and Purdue Pharma point of view. What's your take? Well, uh, it's complicated because I have... Um, governmental clients, county clients who supported uh, the plan. On the other hand, um, I am no fan of the Sacklers, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, at the end of the day, if this settlement is approved, the Sacklers will still be billionaires. And there will be lots of people who died on overdoses to OxyContin and lives and communities, I believe, that were destroyed by this drug. Um, and so... I guess I would say I have very mixed feelings about it. I want money flowing to uh, the families uh, and the people who have been harmed by OxyContin. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I understand the argument uh, made by others that um, the bankruptcy system it should not be used in this way. I'm not saying that I necessarily support that argument, but I certainly understand it. Has money... From the Purdue Pharma, I know they thought bankruptcy, but it, did they pay money to these? Did they pay any money to people, or is they filed bankruptcy right away? There was some earlier litigation, and when I say earlier litigation, I'm talking like pre 2018, where reportedly the Sacklers uh, paid some money uh, to some people, and of course, the Sackler, excuse me, Purdue Pharma itself, the company has pled to crimes for misrepresenting, you know, understating 
the addictive nature of OxyContin, not the Sacklers individually, but the companies. So the fact that the company engaged in wrongdoing is indisputable. But okay. while the case has been uh, tied up through the bankruptcy process, they're not paying. They're not paying claimants. Got it. It's very interesting. Uh, very interesting case because that could change. That could change a lot of things because I don't know if the Sacklers have irrevocable trust, but they took the money out of the business. They put it in trusts that are not in their name. Then they can, you know, I don't know how that would protect them more. And they probably have some of that, but um, it's very, I mean, it's going to, so it went to the Supreme Court. And so you're waiting, you think you'll get the results in June, you said? Yes. And you're, it, that's a really astute point you made, which is that this case is really important for at least two huge reasons. The first is exactly this, which is will people who have been harmed by OxyContin receive, you know, some, uh, you know, Yep. Uh, re, right. Recompense for what's happened to them. Right. But the second is, is can the bankruptcy court system be used this way where over the objection of claimants, uh, people or companies, in this case, the Sacklers individually, who did not file for bankruptcy, get the benefit of bankruptcy protection, including discharge of debt through the bankruptcy system. Uh, and that is a hot topic. We'll see. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, there's a lot I could see pros and cons and, you know, which ways to think about it, um, especially as it relates to healthcare and being a private company versus a public company. There's a lot of ways to skin that cat. Because I think of like if Tesla, you know, went bankrupt and they didn't have any money, does Elon, then can you go pierce Elon Musk's billionaire status, you know, and the changes a lot of things, I guess, is what I would say. Yeah, a way to think about it. Now, that company's publicly held, but that doesn't necessarily change the equation. I mean, if you imagined that um, hypothetically Twitter slash X filed for bankruptcy, but Elon Musk didn't, under what circumstances could Elon Musk get the benefits of bankruptcy protection, including discharge of debt, by agreeing to fund some portion of a reorganization of that company, even though, you know, he's arguably the richest person in the world. Should the bankruptcy system be used to provide him that kind of protection individually? And in a sense, that is the issue in Purdue Pharma, you know, involving the cyclers. Yep. So in, in your new book, Last Right, um, you know, it's, you're, it's sort of like a wake up call to restore maybe the civil justice system in some respect. That's exactly, like, no, okay. that, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, the issue is that we live in an America where large corporations and the politicians they pay are deliberately robbing you and every American consumer of the rights to hold bad companies accountable for wrongdoing when they commit it. And unfortunately, they've been very successful in this legislative initiative over the last 25 years. And in settings like this one, you know, with, you know, your bully pulpit and your intellect, we can debate what is the best use of the civil justice system. And it's a good discussion. But in the boardrooms of America's largest corporations, wealthy power broker power brokers plan on how they can most effectively dismantle or skew that system for their own gain. And my book explains how they do that and why it endangers public safety and consumer protection. Now, is this a Republican slash Democratic issue? Like Republicans are more for the corporation, Democrats are more for the what you're saying? There's not one answer to that. In general, tort reform is a Republican initiative and has been for 25 years. George W. Bush was the tort reformer in chief. Okay. He agreed to carry... Uh, the banner of tort reform, uh, and of course received enormous political funding for his presidential runs from industries that wanted to be held uh, less accountable, or I guess from their perspective, less exposed in the civil justice system. Uh, and, you know, as I say in the book, you know, he became the apex predator of the Seventh Amendment. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, he was very successful. You know, um, the gun industry has almost complete immunity from civil 
liability, no matter how they market their guns, no matter how many of them they sell, no matter who they sell them to, you know, unless it's, you know, an express, you know, violation of federal law in some other respect, they are, they are immune. And that's the only industry that has that kind of immunity on that scale. In other words, in any other context, if if a company recklessly markets a particular product and it causes enormous harm and they know they're doing it that way and they know it's going to cause that harm and, you know, but it's just good economically for them, they do it. They would have to answer to that in the civil justice system. But uh, the gun industry does not. And my argument is, wait a minute. Gun ownership is protected by the Second Amendment, but gun manufacturing is not. Why shouldn't the civil justice system apply to them however it goes? And I think they should, but unfortunately, I think one of the reasons that they don't make their guns safer than they absolutely could, like having, you know, smart user technology for who can use the gun, just like we have for a cell phone, is because they don't have to. There's no price to pay in the civil justice system for not having spent the money to make the gun safer for use as intended. And when you consider that so much gun violence is committed by people other than the one who purchased the gun lawfully, this is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, that's uh, uh, if you think about it, someone steals your cell phone, it's very hard for them to use it because of password or facial recognition. The gun, stolen gun, works just as good as a bought properly gun. You th- I mean, it, if you think about it, it's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, and there's this old adage, you know, in, in disputes about, you know, um, gun law and gun rights. Well, you know, some people say, well, you know, it's, it's not the gun, it's the person and so forth. And my argument is it doesn't have to be the person. In a lot of instances, you could ensure that the only person who used the gun is the one who lawfully purchased it and for whom smart technology recognizes them as as the rightful owner. Yeah. I mean, it's I don't know. I also wonder the same thing with drunk driving. Why a repeat offender of uh, drunk driving, they don't have to uh, when they get back into a car, why they don't have to breathe into something to drive the car. I, I don't understand that because. It seems like so obvious that, all right, let's protect because if, if you have a DUI twice, maybe you're going to have it three times, you know, like people say it violates their rights. I don't know. You may disagree with me on that one, but I think that thing is should be cut and dry, you know, like uh, I agree with you that drunk drivers shouldn't feel free to drive drunk, <laughs> you know, right. And to the extent that we can design a product, right, uh, which is technologically and economically feasible, we should. And I'm, yeah, yeah. I know people that gotten drunk driving things, and then they still, you know, and they just think, oh, they know, they know better, you know, and they, and uh, it's scary. And so I just think like, they get a DUI or whatever, put that device in there, and that I don't know, it should be economically feasible. I mean, I can't nowadays. But all right, so now Jeffrey B. Simon, author of Last Rights, we're going to do our typical ending questions that we ask everyone. What, now, this is putting you on the spot, so you may not have something, but here we go. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Or what is one piece of a great advice you received? The best advice I've ever received is think before you act. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, what was your first or your worst job? My first job was as a camp counselor, and it was a pretty good job because I met a, a, a great gal, and we dated for a while, and I still know her, and she's a great person. Oh, you're not married to her, but you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> my, my camp closed down before I got to be a counselor. It was very annoying. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what do you do when you feel stressed or discouraged? Or are you never stressed? Oh, of course. When, when I am stressed, I internally obsess. I, I con- continue to repeatedly mull over the issue in my mind in ways that are not healthy. Yeah. Right. And so what I find is, is I lack 
uh, the ability to compartmentalize stress when it's intense stress in ways that I should have better coping mechanisms. Okay, you're honest. Um, how, how many unread text messages do you think you have? Well, you get a lot of spam text. Uh, yeah. I would say, you know, I, I've read all or most of the texts from people I recognize okay. now. That's not the same thing as all the DMs I get, yep. you know. On yep. Right. yep. All right. And then um, last question. What was your most difficult challenge in life? <sighs> We're with Jeffrey B. Simon, author of Last Rights. Get it? About protecting the Seventh Amendment and uh, protecting consumers. Here's you the know? answer. Here's the answer. Writing the book? <laughs> no. Um, my most difficult challenge in life has been to reconcile um, when I am not the person that I want to be. That um, I am getting much better in life at putting out in the world, I think, the empathy and dignity and respect that I always do feel for others. And that at times in my life, I have allowed myself to become so busy with this or so obsessed with that, that I don't give people I care about the intention that they absolutely deserve. Um, and uh, I'm, I've been working on that a lot. And so what I would say is it's a work in progress. Got it. Very fair. All right. Well, listen, uh, Seems like you've you've been successful as an attorney, uh, getting some large settlements, working on big cases. Author of the book. Is this your first book or second, it's third? My first book. First. How long did it take you to write? About fourteen months or so. Okay. Did you have like a set time you wrote at? Late at night, early in the morning before I took our daughter to school. You okay. Know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Weekends. It's hard to be consistent. Yeah, and that that's good. Um, so, author of Last Rights. Jeffrey B. Simon coming on the Raz Report. It's a little different than a financial guest, but there's, I mean, hearing about how bankruptcy works and the future of how these things will work is is very interesting to me. So um, thank you for coming on, Jeffrey B. Simon, and uh, get his book if you haven't yet. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.